Hello, everybody. Welcome to Trusty's Vintage Deep Dive, and we are just we're going to be uh, hitting right the edge of vintage this this uh, this evening because tonight I've got my guest bumming back for the. Oh, I did. I should have counted. Third time or fourth time? I Katie? think it's the third time. Pat. Third time, but there's more to come, I'm sure. Uh, coming back for the third time is Katie from Vintage and Vinyl, and this time she is sharing with us vintage swatch watches. And this is one of those cases where all of us are going to start feeling very old because we are definitely in the vintage category and we probably all owned one of these. I know I did. I will admit I went digging for some photographs to see if I could find me wearing one, but I did not. I was not lucky enough. But um, we've got uh, Katie here tonight and she's going to share her personal collection of uh, Swatch watches and then kind of educate us a little bit on Swatch <clears throat> as a company, as an entity and kind of how it's evolved because uh, I, I don't want to like spoil the ending or anything, but I wasn't even aware that Swatch was still running. So mm -hmm. I was still in business. I guess they're always there's You want the Swatch to be still be running, but uh, that mm -hmm. uh, they are still in business. So I'm sure we were going to learn quite a bit. Uh, we'll do a couple quick hellos, but I don't want to wait to put too much time. Give credit to uh, Kelly coming in right at the right at the beginning uh, for joining us. So thanks so much, Kelly. And she is definitely looking forward to. Uh, she says swatch watches are her weakness. Yay, so, Kelly! You know, you're just see, so tonight. Bree in the house. A uh, new name for me. Uh, punk hey, and junk. So hi, Barbie. Thanks for joining. And Lisa is coming in, and we got Brian from the Chicago area. Um, and oh, still has an 80s swatch watch. Okay, yeah, so I don't have any mine anymore. And we've got Carolina Princess is in the house, Cheryl. Uh, so we've got a nice little turnout. Um, but the whole idea behind these, why I don't want to spend a lot of time with the hellos, because this will go up and hopefully be used as an archive. So people that can't watch it live, no big deal. Uh, you get a little bit of the information when you watch the video later. So we're going to start things off, uh, basically give things turning over to Katie, because even though I was a Swatch Watch owner, I don't have any anymore. And I typically try and pick something up if I'm going to do a deep dive. I want to have something to show. And to be honest, I got a little confused on trying to figure out what I should or shouldn't buy because in some cases they were super expensive. And then other cases they were so cheap that I'm like, oh, there must be something wrong with this. And if I get the wrong one, Katie will make fun of me. So I did not uh, get any any tools or any samples. So this one's going to be all uh, on Katie to kind of give us the, uh, the rundown of Swatch. So we'll start with the basic question is why Swatch? How'd you get started? Well, I got started collecting Swatch because I fell in love with watches in general. My grandfather always liked watches, and I just thought it was so cool to have a vintage watch that was also a very well-made watch. Uh, you know, there's a lot of cheap watches on the market, quartz movement watches anyway, and you just see them pretty cheap, and they don't always last, they don't always work. And so I thought it would be fun to collect something that was well-made, that was really fun, and came in a whole variety of different colors and patterns and designs. And that's what's neat about Swatch is they made so many different designs and styles for everybody, and it's just such a cool little collection. Now, one of the things that you started with, or that you just said, is that they're well made. Now, granted, when I had my Swatch watches, I, I'm not 100% sure when the company started, but I would put it probably like in the 80s, late 80s, probably around the time I was in high school, where I think I had maybe a couple of them. I wouldn't have necessarily said they were well made. And like this is something me as an adult, even looking back, I still wouldn't have thought they were well made. They were, they were rubber. So at what I, that or at least the ones that I remember, like that jelly, I don't know if it was rubber, but like the, the, the really, the colorful ones, I think I had a black and a red one. Um, when you say well-made, where's that coming from? So I'm talking primarily about the movement and to really understand Swatch as a whole, we need to look at its history. And I wanted to spend a few minutes talking about this because it really is fascinating. And Swatch saved the Swiss watch making industry in the 80s. So if you go back to 1974, Switzerland was the world's leading producer of watches at over 91 million watches. But they were focusing on a very high end market at the time. And then by the end of the decade, they were down to only 60 million watches, which is very low for Switzerland. And they only had 635 watchmaking companies in existence left, which again is very low. 
and the Swiss banks actually made them combine because they were losing money. So Swatch really came to play because they had to do something to save the Swiss watchmaking industry. And one of the things they noticed is that there was a new movement called a quartz movement that was being made around the world, primarily in Japan. And Japanese uh, were really doing a lot of things, including creating a very thin watch. And they were starting to rise to the top. So Switzerland decided that they needed to create a watch that was similar to what was being produced, but they needed something that was better quality, that was lightweight, that was easy to produce, and that could be mass marketed. And thanks to Nicholas G. Hayek and his team in 1983, Swatch was born, and they worked with a New York ad agency to come up with the name. Swatch literally means second watch, meaning that they were so affordable that you could buy multiple watches. And in fact, in the 80s, people wore multiple ones up their arm. It became kind of an iconic style. And when they released Swatch, they sold millions of them. And it saved the Swiss watchmaking industry and put Swatch and the Swiss watchmaking industry back at number one. And they beat out the Japan and the Japanese. And it's just really, really amazing. So for me, even though the bands are rubber and you have different casings that are not as well made, compared to other quartz movements, they're one of the best movements you can get at that price point. Okay, I'm going to back up on two things. One, you've absolutely blown my mind. I thought Swatch was Swiss watch. <laughs> I had no idea it meant second watch. So, okay, the, you know that marketing did not, in, did not embed in my teenage self. Um, but... You're talking, I just want to clarify, Swatch was an individual maker, though, wasn't it? Like, you're saying that it saved the Swiss watchmaking industry, but it was, that, it was Swatch a conglomeration of makers, or was it a standalone? So Swatch is actually Swatch Group, and they own a ton of watchmakers within Switzerland. So now, if you look them up, I believe they own their part, Omega's part of it, and a few others. So they combined, it stands for AS something something back in the 80s. They combined with a whole bunch of watchmaking houses because they didn't have the money. And the Swiss banks, you can read up on the whole history there, but they forced a lot of the groups to combine. But Swatch is a company, but they also own a whole bunch of other higher end watchmaking uh, companies now. Okay. And I want to circle back to what you were talking about in the movement. I've heard just as a general concept or just a general term, because I'm not knowledgeable in watches, uh, you talk about the quartz movement. Did you say Japan invented that or were popularizing it? Or is that what Swatch came up with? Well, actually, if you go all the way back to the U.S. during that time period, we had invented the quartz movement. Uh, you look at Texas Instruments, they made a lot of quartz movements in their calculators, and they also started making those calculator watches and other watches that were quite popular at the time. But Jap Japan really did a lot. They kind of highlighted more watches and produce more watches with the quartz movement at the time. In fact, they were making the world's smallest and thinnest watch at only two millimeters thick at the time. So uh, definitely something to be rivaled with. And that's why, you know, Swatch came to be and the Swiss watchmaking industry had to do something to save themselves because the Japanese were rising higher and higher as the world's leading producer of watches. Now, we've got a lot of people who are commenting in the chat, either reminiscing or sharing what they already own or still own. So we've got turquoise with a slinky band. Um, like I said, I think I had one that was black and red. Uh, we've got, well, this is from the early 2000s. You talked about the marketing, so for the idea of the second watch and making them, in, uh, making them uh, inexpensive. Were the colors something that was like from the very beginning or did that was, did that develop over time? Well, Nicholas G. Hayek, the man that helped create Swatch, he wanted a watch that wasn't stuffy and that was kind of moving away from a lot of what you had seen coming out of Switzerland. I mean, you were talking about really high end thousands of dollars watches at the time with, of course, different types of movements, one being an automatic watch. So they wanted something that was fun, that they could really market. And their idea was coming up with different colors and designs and working with artists so that people felt like they could express themselves. And it really is a brand all about expression and fun. And of course, making something that's longer lasting. And of course, has a lot of different designs to choose from. 
at a very good price point too. Now you mentioned working with artists. Was that something from the very beginning? Like I know that they did specialty ones. Somebody just shared that there was one from the uh, show um, Crazy for You. So there were some, there were definitely some custom ones and specialty ones. Were the artist designed ones out of the gate or is that something as they already were popular, were they getting artists to do them? Uh, 1985 is when they started working with a lot of artists, including Keith Haring was a big one. In fact, I'll talk about that more in the show as we get into some of the swatches to look for. But that early Keith Haring watch that came out around 1985 can be worth some serious money now because they only made, I think, like 250 of them. So those early designers and different artists are quite popular and they really made a lot of really cool collections. In fact, right now they've got a watch out on the Swatch website. The Swatch is still made today. That's with the Modern Museum of Art in New York. So they have a whole series of different cool watches featuring Pablo Picasso and Monet and different kind of pop designs from around New York City. And they've relaunched a key pairing line, which is pretty cool. I actually have that watch here I can show, but they, this is a more modern version of Keith Haring, but they've worked with Disney and Keith Haring to design this watch. This came out last year. So this is pretty cool. And of course, Swatch is known for its really awesome packaging. So it comes with this special limited edition box, but they have all kinds of really cool art. Was the packaging something it was always known for? I don't really remember that. Yeah, so Swatch made a lot of different packaging. I mean, some of their packaging in the 80s, this is a case from the 80s, was clear and kind of basic. They made a lot of these plastic cases, but Swatch also had some really cool special watches that you could get at Christmas time or they came out of like when the jellyfish came out. They had a whole series of unique watches. And when they put those out, they came out with a special case that goes along with them. So I've got several cases here that are special that come with the watches. This is one that was put out a few years ago, I think in 2011 to celebrate Swatch history. So this watch came out with a special gold case and then you could get the watch and on the inside, oh, 2013. So it celebrates Swatch all the way up to 2013. It's got the years that they were in production up until that point, it's got the really cool like gold band, kind of reminiscent of the golden jelly. And then they have the cool case. So Swatch kind of does these cool little sleeves. This one's also really cool. This one came out a few years ago, removed before flight. So if you're into like airline stuff, this is a cool watch. They've got the still plastic case that Swatch is known for. And then it's got boarding pass and flight and passenger, and then you've got like delayed on time and a really cool design on the watch itself. But then you've got this cool case and they, they made all kinds of ones. Like if you travel to different cities, they've got New York with the special New York case. They've got one for Miami Beach. And these uh, Miami ones and New York ones, you can only get at the stores, sort of like the Starbucks you were here mugs. You can only get these when you're visiting. Miami or New York. So you can't just go to their website and buy these, but they've got some really pretty cool designs on the watch themselves. So they, they were known for their casing and packaging as well. And in the 80s, I wish I had more of the fun ones to show, but they, they're really expensive and they just don't survive. Some of them had fur coming off of them and like cool little plastic attachments, but those over time, unfortunately, kind of fall off or people throw away the cases. So two questions coming up based on that. Um, so one, I guess just in general, I guess if you're talking about the oldest ones, are the cases themselves collectible? Oh, very much so. Uh, because people are looking, especially hardcore 80s and 90s collectors, people are looking for the cases that went with the watches. And even today, you know, if you've lost your case, people probably would want to find a match to one of their newer watches if it had a special design. And the watches themselves are valuable, but it's also more valuable when you have the case. Like this one here, it has the word automatic. So this was 
uh, made in the 90s. I think it was 1990 or 1991, Swatch started coming out with automatic watches, which are pretty cool because they were, you know, usually an expensive watch to buy, but they were able to make automatic watches at a price point that everybody could afford. So this is really cool. I found this watch in the original case online, and this one is the PD watch that came out in 1995. It is automatic. You can see it's automatic movement there, but it does have the plastic casing. And this one's pretty desirable and sought after, and it's hard to find. So this was pretty amazing that I got it in the original case that says automatic. And I think there's a price tag in here. The person that bought this paid $62 back in the 90s when it came out, which for an automatic watch is really inexpensive, and it's got a beautiful design. Now, you mentioned that, uh, like the New York one and a couple that you've shown, uh, that they were only available at the stores. So we've got a question that's coming in from Jeannie Lyle is, you know, in your personal experience, what's the most awesome Swatch store you've been to? But then kind of related to that, how many watches were limited in, in distribution like that? So I love the Swatch store in New York City. The one in Times Square is probably the most magical one. There are many of them across the globe. I've never been to one overseas, but the ones in the United States are pretty cool. And the one in New York City is the best. I mean, they have several in different areas of New York, but if you go to the Times Square one, that's sort of the hub. That's the one that's always featured on TV at New Year's Eve. You can always see it in the background. It's two stories tall. And you have all this really cool extra stuff that you can't get at other Swatch stores. So they're pretty cool. Now, I don't know how many cities have a special watch that you can buy. I know New York does, Miami does, and I'm sure overseas there are certain ones that you can only get, say, in Germany. I know, I think, in Japan, too, because Japan has a lot of cool, like, limited things that you can get in Japan, and I believe you can get special swatches in Japan, I've heard. But I don't know how many cities did that, but these are ones to look out for because people can only buy them at the store. So if you haven't been to New York, it's kind of fun if you can pick them up on eBay because you can't get them, uh, say, through swatch.com. So Cheryl is saying hi to Louie. Are the sprinklers yeah. bothering Louie again tonight? Yes, the sprinklers have started and it's raining here. So Louie's going a little nuts. She says hello to all of you folks. So one of the questions, what all the ones that you showed, including that 2013 Celebrate one, and, I, and you didn't date some of the other ones, they still have that rubber or the jelly type band. Now, I my l adult life, later life experience with Swatch is limited to... Um, a purchase and I should have like actually gotten a specific date. It would have been around 2010, maybe 2012. I did a trip to uh, Germany and Austria with my daughter and our, uh, my, her mother did not come on that trip. So we wanted to get a gift. We went to the Swatch store and on the grand, uh, in the, you know, kind of the downtown area of Munich, right across the street from the Glockenspiel. So we just picked up a watch. What the one we picked up, I don't think it was limited to Munich. I don't remember anything special about the box, but it wasn't rubber. It was metal and it was designed. It had, I think it was like polished silver and then brushed silver and they were links and you had to take out the links with a, at a jeweler or at a swatch store to get it to the custom link that wasn't adjustable. Um, I will just say sh my ex-wife hated it. Uh, so I would have liked to have gotten it for this um, this sh uh, show, but I think it went to Goodwill at the divorce. Um, so I just, did they drift away from the rubber and then come back? Or did was it kind of, was the metal running at the same time as all the plastic and rubber? So in the 1980s and 90s, you see a lot of the rubber and you start to see a big shift in the 90s in Swatch where they're doing a lot of automatic watches and you start to see a little bit more metal coming in on the casing. This is a watch from 1989. This is the Moonquake and it actually has a little bit of metal. It is still plastic overall but it's got a little bit of a copper color and that actually is metal on the side there and then you've got the day date movement and that fun uh, quartz you can see through, see the movement inside, but it is a rubber band. So you start to see in the late 90s, 
you know, that they're doing a lot of these 80s, late 80s, early 90s is what I'm, I'm trying to say. You see a lot of movement towards some of these higher quality uh, watches and they're doing things with more metal. Now, when you get into the 2000s and of course present day, they are still making the rubber ones because they're quite popular because they can do a lot of fun designs, but they do have currently a big push for some of their metal ones. And I've got several here. This is actually a swatch. And this one I purchased, I believe in 2016. This is an automatic swatch. You can see the word swatch there on the rotor. So and swatch is only on the back. Is there anything on the front that indicates it's swatch? So this one does not. Oh, uh, interesting. Do. I would never have guessed that was swatch. Back. And it has a metal band. Of course, these are the links like Patrick was talking about. You have to change out. But of course, any swatch store can do it. Or if you have a jeweler's kit that I have at home that's really inexpensive for like $11, you can do it yourself and change the link. So this is a cool one. There's also this one. This is the St. Charles. Came out, uh, I believe, 2019, if I'm remembering. It's an automatic watch as well. Now, this one does say swatch up at the top there. And you've got that cool metal band on the side. And then they even made a whole slew of metal casings with leather bands. And this is one of my favorites. This is all black. You can see the movement on the inside. My band's a little dirty. I've had this quite a while. And it's got a really nice leather band. And then this one would have originally come out with a metal band. This is the Blood and Soul. And these are more modern but this one I think is probably one of my favorites. And you can see the inner workings of the watch. That's something Swatch was really good at, and they're well known for this kind of clear front where you can see all the movements. It started with the jellyfish and has continued onward. And I just think this is cool. This would have had a metal band. Someone put a leather band on this one, but I just think it's neat. So they do have a lot of metal watches now that you can buy. Now you mentioned your favorites. Do you wear the, your watches? Yes, I wear all my swatches. Now, some of the vintage ones, admittedly, I don't wear. Uh, I've got several from the 80s that are just so delicate. And this is where you were talking about them not being well made. The movements are really nice in swatches, but their bands, not talking modern bands, because their modern bands are really good quality. They're, they're more of a rubbery jelly material versus that kind of more plasticky material of the 80s and 90s those bands tend to break. And so I am a little bit more careful with some of my vintage watches. This is a great example of that. This watch came out in 1988. This is the uh, 177 watch and it's got the swatch guard on it. And this one has a very delicate band. I mean, it is just a thin plastic, probably buckling it would just break it over time. So I just leave it to enjoy as a display piece. But a lot of them are made with these just really kind of thin plastic bands. This one's from 1992. It's a very, very cool watch with the coffee and the little newspaper strip on the side. But again, you can just see how thin that is. And over time, they just kind of don't survive. Now, the newer watches are really well made. I'll show you the bands so you can get a, a different uh, look at some of the newer watches. This is a new swatch with this kind of really rubbery sports type band. And you can just see how thick and nice that is compared to this one. So that's why I wear some of these more modern ones, because they're a little bit easier to maintain. Now, you mentioned that the one watch that you got with a leather band would have originally had the metal. Is there, uh, do, are, how would you know that? Do you, is there a guide? Is there, you know, do you go to the website? How would you know a certain watch would have been issued with a certain band versus when you, if you're like out in the wild and you find it, then you know it's been replaced? So one of the ways you can do that is if you look on their website, you can see some of these more modern watches are still for sale. The Blood and Soul, I believe, is still available. It's been around for several years because it's so popular. And I had it when it first came out. And then there was a tragic story and something happened to it. And I had to go find a replacement. 
and the website was sold out of it. So I ended up buying it on eBay. And I knew because I had bought the original one that it came with a metal band, but you could check on their website and see. You can also call Swatch and they will look up a watch for you. I called about uh, the lady jellyfish that I have. I had a couple of questions and the lady was so nice. She actually is able to look back in their catalog and pull it up. And so she looked up this 1998 watch for me, one of the first jellyfishes that came out. This is a small lady jellyfish and was able to help me. There's also a really good book. And again, I'm not sponsored by this gentleman at all, but I love this book by Frank Edwards. And this has all of your vintage watches in it. And it's really categorized nicely. So you've got different categories here that talk about like they're automatic, they're solar watches, they're um, chromo watches, the Olympic collection. And it shows you what it would have looked like originally. So you could look for those bands because that is something that happens a lot is people do switch the bands uh, because you can easily do that on a swatch. Maybe they don't like the metal ones where they need a replacement. So people find a different band and sometimes they don't always go. Um, so that is something that. Sorry, I was, I was on mute. <laughs> <laughs> I, I have probably over a dozen, if not two dozen watches, not swatch, uh, but I haven't worn them. It, I attended ice a couple years ago, and so I haven't been able to wear them since that. But I used to just chew through bands. So they get replaced all the time, and I would usually just get cheap bands. That's probably why they were getting worn through. Um, but one of the – Casey Myers is taking us down a bit of a, a memory lane. So she's talking about the Swatch Guard, and I vaguely – I think I know what she's talking about, but I want to bring that up because I think that's something to do with the band – but is that, the, is that like the little rubber band thing that stretches across the front? Oh, there we go. Yes. Yeah, so they made two versions of this. This one is the Swatch Guard. It just has, it's plastic. It's got the circle with the little things that come over the side. And then they made something called a Swatch Guard 2, which was actually rubber. And the thing I don't like about that one is it's actually a line that goes through the middle of the watch. So you hook it over the bands as opposed to the side. But don't discount your swatch accessories. So when you're collecting swatch or you're looking for swatch to sell, these accessories can be quite popular and people want them. And especially if you can find the swatch guard or the swatch guard two, and it's spelled T-O-O, -O, not T-W-O, are really collectible. And they can sell for around $25 to $30 a piece, even if it's not in the package, because people remember the swatch guards and they want that. And this was pretty cool. It actually came with the black swatch guard. They came in all different colors. I think you could get red, green, blue. They might have had a pink. I know they have a white one. So they were quite popular at the time. And basically, they were made just as a protector for your watch face, because these watch faces, like any watch face, can get pretty scratched up as you're moving about. So it was to get, that was uh, Carolina Princess was asking. So it was really to protect the face of the watch. Yeah. Now, exactly. this is where memory lane can get a little, to have some detours to it. So you're saying that the circular one with the, would attach to the side, that's earlier than the rubber one that stretched across? No, they were just two different styles. I oh, okay. They, they were the same style. Okay. I, mean, I only remember the one that stretched across the front, probably because like you said, it was annoying. I don't think I ever had one. Was that catered more to the female market or did they have those for men too? They came in all different sizes. Now the one, the watch I just showed you here, uh, this one is a female size. These are the smaller swatch watches of the 80s and 90s. And then they had what would be considered a male size. Swatch now has gotten better where they do a lot of unisex things because really their watches are unisex in my opinion. Uh, but this would have been like the male larger size. This is the McGregor watch from 1985. This one's really hard to find. And it would have had a bigger guard that you could have purchased separately. You didn't get them with the watches. But they were always cool. purchased separately? As far as I know, they were always purchased separately. It's just something you could add. Swatch also made a whole bunch of novelty things. They made sunglasses, like in 1993 clip-on sunglasses. They even had uh, pagers at one point, watches that were pagers called Swatch the Beep. That was their, like, new invention at the time. Of course, you know, pagers are long gone, but they had that. They even were working on a smart car at one time in the 90s, and they had phones. So if you do see some of the like swatch other products, they are worth picking up as well because they're pretty unique. 
Now, one of the questions that's coming in, and I do, and I will, I, I'm trying to catch all the questions. Uh, there's a couple. There's one on theme that's been asked twice. I'll I will get to that, Kelly. Um, but as we're talking about where you got them, uh, Carolina Princess is reminiscing about the Benetton store, which is like a, just an absolute flash from the past. Um, but were swatch were swatch watches always geared or sold only from their own stores or were they available in other retailers i honestly don't remember where i was getting mine in the 80s probably got it as a gift so were they only at swatch watches or were they our swatch stores or were they available through places like benetton and things like that i do believe that other stores carried them i'm not so sure about the 80s and 90s time frame but i know when i started collecting in the 2000s uh, you could buy them at Dillard's, you could buy them at different other retailers. And I'm sure that they connected with some of those because like Jacksonville does not have a swatch store. So I was getting all of mine at the time, the new ones through Dillard's because they had a display of them. And so the question on themes is related to that. So if say you got it from Dillard's, would Dillard's carry an exclusive line that would be just available at Dillard's or did all the department stores carry all the same watches well they didn't carry an exclusive line just for dillard's but they had certain ones and and that's the thing with swatches they make so many watches they typically produce about two different lines per year and that has been consistent since the 80s so i mean there's a lot of watches out there and only certain stores can carry so many so you might call one store looking for a watch and they may not have it now, generally, some of the bigger stores like the New York store, the Miami Beach store, they're going to have all of Swatch's selections. But uh, some of them are only available at certain stores, probably just because they can only carry so many. And then online, Swatch has uh, almost everything available. But sometimes they do sell out because there are limited drops of Swatch. So sometimes like they will put only so many of them out and say, OK, at this time they're becoming available. And then there's a mad dash to get them. For example, the James Bond series. Now they've done James Bond, speaking of theme watches, they've done James Bond since probably the 90s, I believe. They've had a different series of James Bond watches come out and they had a new series that dropped last year and it sold out in like three minutes. I couldn't get any of them. And if you look them up now, they're consistently selling for around 400 a watch. And they have a really cool package. They're in an old VCR box, which is pretty cool. And they have different designs. Um, they had Moonraker and uh, License to Kill and a whole slew of others. But those are ones to look out for as well, because those ones are not easy to find because they only made so many of them and they dropped at a certain time. Now, related to that, like the James Bond one, uh, Kelly's question is specific to the theme of Miami Vice. Were these, I, I don't know, if, do you know if there was a Miami Vice themed watch that you're aware of? Kelly, I don't know. That's something I can look up. I have not seen one, but it doesn't mean that they didn't make one because like I said, Swatch made quite a few watches. I mean, this book that I have on Swatch doesn't even highlight all the ones that were made. So it is really uh, kind of hard to say, but it's something that you can look up and, and I'll do more research on as well. So, but for the ones that were licensed, like say for the James Bond one, were they, do you know, was this a case where the license holders for James Bond went to Swatch and asked them to make a watch you know, on that line? Or did Swatch just say, we're gonna license this and we're gonna just put out, we're gonna put out watches. Were they basically, were they um, not consignment, but like, were they, were they uh, requested or did Swatch just say, hey, we want to put this out? Do you know? Well, probably Swatch reached out to the James Bond series of movies because they knew they would be popular. It could be the other way around, but typically Swatch worked with a lot of artists and brands. And one of the brands that they worked with, speaking of that, is Coca-Cola. Now, what's interesting about these Coca-Cola watches and why I want to show them today is they're actually not Mark Swatch. So you can do some research on this yourself, but Swatch and Coca-Cola had a brand deal making swatches for a short period of time in the 80s. But for some reason, Coca-Cola did not want their product to also say Swatch because it conflicted with the fact that they were Coca-Cola. So they only let them put the word Swiss on them. Now, I have actually seen the display case that these were sold in. I had an opportunity to buy it, but it was very expensive. So I left it behind. But it did say Coca-Cola in conjunction with Swatch or something to that effect on the top of the display. And this is a Coca-Cola Swatch. You can see it just says Swiss there, very small. 
at the bottom, but this is something that was in collaboration with Swatch. And then here, this one is also Swatch, but it's Coca-Cola and it just says Swiss. And these, I believe, were made in the late 80s. Uh, this one might have been early 90s. I know for sure this one was 80s and probably was a ladies watch because it's that smaller size. So they do a lot of collaborations. Now, if you look at the Keith Haring one I showed, it actually does say Disney and Mickey Mouse and, and Keith Haring in collaboration with, Squat, with Swatch on the front. So that was probably something that they arranged together to put out. Now, the... Um with the Coca-Cola ones with the boxes, did the you said their swatch was nowhere on the watch. Was the swat was there a box? Would it have said swatch or did they keep it even off the box? Now that's something I don't know because I've never actually seen the box. Now the way that I saw the display was they were literally just hanging by the uh, band here, the buckle at the top of the band. So I don't know if they would have come in the box. I'm assuming that they would have but I, I don't know if they actually said Swatch or not. Uh, but that is, those are the only cases of Swatch that I know of that's not marked, but that actually is Swatch. That's really interesting. Now, when Swatch first started, before they became super popular, were the, you said they were still like this, that standard clear case. How many different designs did they put out? Do you know or about how many? Were they specific colors? Were they always designed to be interchangeable? Were they like, change the bands and all that? How did I like, kind of like, how did it start versus how did it develop? So Swatch started out creating a lot of basic watches. And of course they were very popular, but the classic watch, and I wish I had one to show, but I'll kind of use this one as an example. They made a couple of watches that were just sort of plain. And just imagine this watch, but all black with the day-date movement on the side. That is an example of the classic series that came out in the 80s. And they have uh, reissued that watch today, but of course it's a totally different size and different material, so you can easily tell them apart. But those kind of started more simple, more plain, and then they moved into all these fun, crazy designs and colors. In 1985, like I said, that's when they started collaborating with a lot of artists and they had all different funky colors. I mean, Swatch really, even though they started with a few plain ones, from the beginning has really been all about just wild designs and colors and you know, kinds of things. And they made a lot of statements. Some of their watches you'll read, they made a lot of big, bold statements that a lot of other people weren't making in fashion at the time. Now, is there any of the original colors that are the most desirable or to, to look for, assuming that they haven't been changed out? Is there something that's more rare? Uh, you said the black was reissued, but like what other colors would have been the most popular from early on? Well, there's a lot of them from the 80s and 90s to look out for, because to be honest, most of them, like I said, even though they have a really good quality movements, their bands just don't last because a lot of them crack, they break, they get discolored, you know, that kind of thing. So all of the ones really from the 80s and 90s are really collectible. And as Patrick was saying, can command a pretty penny, even if they don't work, you would be surprised how many watches can still sell for around $80 even if it doesn't work because they just are not around. I think a lot of people either after the eighties, they were kind of done with the trend, they threw them away or they broke or whatever. So there's a lot of them that are still really worth picking up. But some of the ones to highlight, I definitely would look out for the jellyfish. Now they came in two sizes. I have the lady jellyfish here. I showed this one earlier. Hey, can you clarify, is there, a, is there an image of a jellyfish? What is it? What makes it a jellyfish? I can't quite see it. So this is called jellyfish because it's clear like a jellyfish. And uh, like with jellyfishes in the wild, you can see sort of their, I don't, I want to say inner workings like a watch because that's what you're seeing here. But, you know, when you see a clear jellyfish on the beach, you can see their like structure on the inside, sort of like this watch. You can see the movement and everything on the inside. So that's why they named it the jellyfish. And this was a, a special watch that came out. Uh, in 1983, and these are really, really collectible. And some of these can sell for hundreds if they're working. I mean, they're just a hard watch to find. Another one that I would look out for is this. This is the McGregor, and this one came out in 1985. They've kind of done a newer version of this, but it's not at all the same. It's modeled after the McGregor, but you can tell that it looks nothing like it. This is one that I would definitely look out for. This was kind of a big seller 
in the 80s, and everyone probably remembers the McGregor, so that one is going to be worth some money. You also want to look out for these. These are calendar watches. Now, this one came out in 1998. I have two, and this one has the calendar year for 1998, and then it's got all of the dates, and then what's pretty cool is instead of your typical numbers, they have December, May, February, April, and so on and so forth, and these are really popular because people remember a certain year. Now, this one also is something to look out for, along with the calendar theme. This came out in 2000 in celebration of the millennium. And this one's a special watch because it's got the black and the gray together. So this one's really also something to watch out for. And then any of the automatic watches are just going to sell really well. This one is St. Peter's Gate. It's very sought after. It came out in 1993. And it's an automatic watch. It's got some really cool designs on it. And this one is still working because, of course, it's an automatic watch. And unless the movement inside gets damaged, usually these are still going to work. So these really do hold their value well. I mean, Swatch right now is just very collectible because, again, people are looking for the ones they had in the 80s. Or collectors like myself really want to get some of these vintage ones. And they're just impossible to find. Uh, so even if you find just like a band, pick it up. Someone might be looking for a band replacement. If you find just the, the watch face, someone might have the band, but looking for the watch face. I mean, you can still get some really decent money for either parts or watches that aren't working. Here's another series that was very popular. This one is the 177 I showed earlier. There were two versions of this. There's the men's version and the ladies version. And this has the ruler on the side. This one is also something, if you look it up online, you're not going to find it. Now, I'm talking again about an online market primarily because I've never seen a lot of these in antique shops. But I'm sure somewhere in some part of the world, there's an antique store that might have one of these just collecting dust. But you're typically going to find these uh, online. And then any of the special ones that they've done over the years, like the collaboration ones, you want to look out for like the Keith Herring. Let me show you the Keith Herring from the 80s. If you can find that one, it's consistently selling for around a thousand dollars because it's a special watch. You know, they, they came out with all kinds of cool artists and those watches are very, very collectible. You can also look for the chronograph watches. I mean, these are really neat as well. There's just so many of them out there. And I would say anyone from the 80s or 90s is going to be ones that are, are really sought after because there's just not many of them left. So let me show you this Keith Herring one. Should have had this marked. Here's the original jellyfish I was talking about earlier with the big size. That's the big size. I have the lady jellyfish still looking for the large size swatch. But, I mean, there's just so many different styles and designs that you can find. But here's the Keith Herring one. This one, I would say, out of all the swatches, is the one you want to look out for. I think they only made 250 of these or so. And they, again, are commanding crazy price tags because a lot of collectors either already have them, so they're kind of hiding in people's collections, or they're just not many available. I saw one yesterday that was actually signed by Keith Herring going for $20,000 online because Keith Herring, you've also got Keith Herring collectors. So not only just Swatch, but now you've got Keith Herring artists that want that as well. Backing up a second, this is for my own edification. You've mentioned now a couple of times the reference to automatic watch. Yes. And I think I might have had the, a different definition of it. So can you just can you define what you mean by that the automatic watch that will always continue working? Is that a wind up watch or is that a battery operated watch? So Swatch uh, also created automatic watches, and automatic watches are another type of movement that you can get. You can get quartz movements. Those movements are like these watches. They just take a battery, and that's how they run. But you also have automatic watches. Now, these are like wind-up watches. So you'll see back here there's a rotor. And what this rotor does is you can either you know, move it as you're moving your hand, it will naturally wind the watch, or you can wind it up by just doing this. And once you wind it, you'll see this mainspring. You see that little spring down there? That's the mainspring. And what that does is that st stores the watch's power. So the rotor winds the mainspring, and then it releases power to that balance wheel up at the top. And that balance wheel that's going back and forth is releasing power to the watch and helps it run. 
once the mainspring runs out or becomes wide in the watch, it will stop working. And all you have to do is wind it back up and it will be good to go. Or if you just continue wearing it, it automatically winds. You can also get a watch winder, put it on it, and the watch winder is set for so many days and so many turns per minute, and it will naturally wind the watch. But automatic watches need very little service and they continue to run because you don't have to replace the battery. The only time they really quit working is if maybe the oil dries up in them or you somehow damage the movement like dropping it off of a building. Most of the time those will run consistently. These have issues because the battery dies or what happens is people will leave the batteries in them for long periods of time and not wear the watch and then the batteries corrode. And that's another issue with the 80s and 90s watches is a lot of people probably left the battery in and when the style kind of, you know, fizzled out a little bit, they just threw it in a drawer and then you find a lot of them where they're all white and corroded on the back. So if you're going to store your swatches and you're not able to wear a lot of your vintage ones, take the batteries out. That will really help preserve them. I'm glad I asked. I had no idea that swatch even did the self-winding or the winding uh, watches. And I did not know those were called uh, automatic. So one of the questions, I had a couple of questions coming in through the chat, trying to find some of them, but we were talking about the older ones. I guess this would also go for the uh, more recent ones, um, is cleaning them. So is it, I guess, and probably if you're dealing more with, I would assume more of the rubber or plastic as opposed to the metal ones, uh, possibly magic eraser, or is there something specific that would be uh, preferential for use for swatch? Well, I always want to avoid the battery compartment. Obviously, you don't want water getting in there because that can cause a problem. Even though the newer swatches are water resistant, I still would be very careful about that. But one of the best ways to clean vintage watches is if you just lay them out on a paper towel like this one, you can see the band's pretty dirty. I've even got some of the ones that are newer where the bands are clear. And I'll show you this one that they start to really yellow over time. I mean, this one you can see is just, it was clear and now it's yellow. This was the first swatch that I had and modern swatch anyway. And you can see it starts to yellow. So the best way to do that is really lay these flat on a paper towel, get a little bowl with some dish soap. Dawn dish soap is very mild and very nice. And a little toothbrush and just gently scrub the bands and, you know, around the, the watch back you can watch out for that battery compartment and then lightly go over the face and that will really give them a good clean now i have not tried to remove the yellowing some people have said that you can try toothpaste and that works i've never tried that i don't know if that works or not i would be cautious because toothpaste is abrasive so it might end up scratching the watch more than doing any help but you can look up about yellowing i don't know if you'd ever get that out of the plastic but at least it will give it a good clean Excellent. Uh, another question was, you've mentioned a couple of times more for the limited edition ones that they had a drop of only like 250. In general, you said they do two lines a year. About how many, are we talking about millions of watches, thousands of watches? How hard are they to come by when they do a, t a traditional or a typical drop as opposed to something that's a custom or a limited edition? Yes. Yeah, so now when Swatch does drops, for example, they did a whole series of these and they're still available on their website. I have one in almost every color. Uh, these are just the, the new Ghent. That's what they're calling them. Uh, they made a whole bunch of these. They're still available. So typically, you know, these are not hard to get. They usually will keep restocking them and there's something they're always going to have. Now, there's a few that are really popular that might sell out and they may not have them back because again, they were a limited thing. So these came in all different colors where these might get a little harder to find when you're looking at the newer watches is sometimes they change the color of the inside. So you see here, this the design of the quartz movement has a red. This one has a white and a purple. They made several versions of these. And so like if you wanted the white and the purple one, you may not be able to get that now because they may have changed the color. You can also look at Swatch's website because they do something that's relatively new. I think it only came out in the last two years and you can actually create your own Swatch. So you can go on there and pick your different colors. I mean, they kind of have a limited amount of things you can choose from, but you can pick your band, you can pick your color, you can pick the inside and the design. And that's something I think we're gonna start seeing becoming more collectible if people give that up because it's kind of a one of a kind item. 
Interesting. Now, speaking of one of a kind, that goes back to a question that actually Jeannie Lyle put out very at the very beginning. I didn't scroll back far enough. Is are do you have any? Uh, what's your unicorn? What's your white whale? Are there any uh, watches, swatch that you're looking for? Uh, you're trying to add to your collection. Well, I'm looking for an original uh, jellyfish that's not the lady jellyfish. I have the small one. I'm looking for the big one. There's also one featuring Shakespeare that came out, I believe, 1991, if I've got the date right. And I'm looking for that. Of course, I want the Keith Haring one because I, I love art and Keith Haring is a big inspiration to me. I absolutely love Keith Haring's work. Uh, I've seen a lot of it in New York, so I, I would love to find that one, but I doubt that I will because it's it's so hard. I mean, there's just so many from the 80s. I constantly am marking things in this book that I'm like, oh, man, I'd love to find that. And they did another version of the McGregor uh, that's a plaid. I showed the McGregor with the, the plaid. Where did it go? Here it is. But they did another version that's like more of a tight knit plaid. It's kind of closer to this one. And I would like to find that one as well. But that one I've never seen up, come up for sale online. Cheryl Ross actually had a really good question we didn't cover is how do you, you said you do wear them, but when you're not wearing them, how do you keep or display your swatches? So I'll show you this case here. This is one of the cases that I have. Um, I keep all of my vintage swatches in their original case here if I have them. And the ones that I do wear that are modern I have, these are some of the ones I didn't show, but this is a big watch case. You can buy this, I think for around $40 off of Amazon. It's got like a faux glass and then it's got these really nice cushions. So that's how I store them. Uh, the vintage ones that I keep in the cases, I just sort of stack them up in my dresser drawer. I have some of my favorites displayed just to enjoy. And then actually, I have a couple of watch winders I bought myself. Now, watch winders are not that cheap, so just be warned on that. But this is a company called Wolf. I buy their watch winders, and the neat thing about them is you can put like four together in a cube hook them up to one power strip, and then you can put all your automatic watches on and they will wind themselves. So all of my automatic swatches I do have on the watch winders when I'm not wearing them because it is good to keep the automatic watches wound and going every so often so the movements don't get sticky. Excellent. Uh, Casey came up with a question that you kind of have touched on, but I wanted to circle back. You you showed, I think it was the one that had the yellowing band, you said was your you know, quote unquote first swatch watch. Was that your first collecting or is that one of your oldest watches? You, what is the oldest and newest swatches you own? So this one is the, as far as my own personal collection, this really was the first watch that I bought to wear. I had vintage swatches at the time, and I think the first vintage swatch I got, I won this one off of an auction, which was the Moonquake, and I was so excited to get this. I actually won this while I was in the supermarket because the auction was ending, and I was in Publix, and I was trying to buy groceries, and I was watching on my phone in the middle of the frozen food aisle. I remember this clear as day, and I won it for like $15. And I was so excited because this watch can go for hundreds. So I was like, oh my gosh, I won that swatch. And then I went to Dillard's and they had a whole display of them. And I thought, I got to get one that I can wear, you know, and I saw this one and it's reminiscent. This is kind of came out like the lady uh, jellyfish. They made a golden jelly that was a Christmas special and it's clear like this. And it had a thinner uh, gold rim around the outside. So this was kind of like in celebration or like relaunch of the golden jelly. And I just fell in love with this. And I, I wore it so much. I've broken the, the, the thing off of it. I have to get a new, new band for that because it's one of my favorites. I mean, I wore that thing every day for years and years and I still, I still wear them. The oldest one I probably have though in my collection is this one. I think, did I say 19, 84 for this. I, I don't remember the date top of my head. This one or the McGregor is probably the oldest one I have as far as the 80s watches. The 80s watches are just expensive and they're hard to find, so I don't have as many of those. We're approaching the top of the hour, but Casey came up with another question. I think uh, based on the case that you showed, it's a valid question, is how many do you own? Do you know how many you own? Well, that's a good question. I probably have about 30 swatches that are modern and then 15 vintage ones. I think um, 
gosh, I've got a few more on the winders in the back that I didn't even bring. So, I mean, and that, that I didn't show, but like my System 51s, uh, this is an automatic watch, watch made uh, more recent. But the cool thing about it is it only uses 51 parts to make it work. So that was kind of a cool thing. So I do have several of these I haven't shown. Uh, so that maybe makes it like 35. They also did, as far as uh, limited edition watches, I did want to show this. This is in collaboration with the Louvre. They made three of these. I think they're sold out of them now, but this is the one featuring the Mona Lisa. And the band's pretty cool because it's cut out where her eyes are. <laughs> so they have all kinds of cool ones. And then for Louie, they made a pug watch. And of course, I had to get the pug watch. <laughs> awesome. Now, uh, Carolina Princess, uh, Beth had a question. You showed it on a couple of the different ones, but she's specifically saying, also she's asking if the, well, the marking, whether it's on the center or the back, I think you said it depended on the watch, but are the bands marked? So that's a great question. Um, some of the newer bands are marked. You can see that they say swatch. This one is the flag time watch. It has all the different flags on it. It says swatch, and then on the watch face itself, it will say swatch, but then on the bottom part of the band, it won't. Now, on the vintage ones, that is a very good question because I wanted to point this out. This is not marked swatch on, well, it is marked swatch on the band, but it's not marked swatch here, but you will notice that it is marked on the watch face, and what's pretty cool about the vintage ones in my experience, all of them have this, is it will say swatch, and then I don't know if it's going to focus, but there's a tiny, tiny little marking the size of like an ant that says the year. So that's kind of nice. The new uh, swatches that are coming out that are doing a lot of these uh, reissues of the old ones, the sizes are different. They're going to be like the big size. They're going to have a different band. You can feel this is like a rubbery um, band with a wider strap than the old ones, and they're not marked swatch in the year. So you can really easily spot the differences uh, from an old watch to a new swatch, because one, they've got the date and the word swatch at the bottom. Most of the new swatches are marked up at the top swatch, and they're just a different material, and they're you know kind of whiter. That's fantastic. Well, we are hitting the top of the hour, so I'd like to uh, always try and keep these a little bit under that. So is there anything else you wanted to show or didn't get to talk about that we didn't cover? I think I've covered pretty much everything. I do want to talk one quick second about the Olympics because Swatch did a lot for the Olympics, and that is something that is really cool. Talking again about limited edition watches and special things Swatch did, and they did a lot of special things, so it's hard to cover it all. But they did a lot of things with the Olympics. And in 1996, they were chosen to be the official timekeeper of the Olympics. And of course, Swatch was blasted all over the big timekeeper pieces in the Olympics. And they started making lines of watches for the Olympics. So this is one that's not vintage. I don't have the 1996 Atlanta one. That is one I'm looking for. But my mom actually works in the news business. And she got to go to the Olympics in Rio and cover them. And one of the things I told her that I wanted, if she could find, was an Olympic swatch watch. So she did bring this back for me. This is celebrating the Olympic spirit. It's got the very cool band box, I mean. And this is for the Rio Olympics. So after the Olympics are over, you will not find these for sale. These are limited editions, so these definitely can go for some money now. But this is the Olympic Rio swatch watch which is pretty cool. And you can see down there, it says Rio, the Olympics, and it's got Swatch. And they came out with several designs, but I really like this one because of course I have an affinity for the watches. You can see the inner working. So definitely keep your eye out for those Olympic Swatches as well. That is fantastic. And as Peterson said, she's watching the Olympics right now. So who knows, there might be a whole series of watches coming out as a result of this year's Olympics. Yes. Uh, so thank you so much, Katie, for joining me. And uh, thanks for everyone in the chat that came along and uh, asked all the questions. Love my huckster hecklers. You guys had some great questions and uh, I learned quite a bit. I hope everyone else did as well. So if you're not already subscribing to Katie, uh, she can be found as her channel shows there on her screen, Vintage and Vinyl. And she is, uh, that is uh, in both YouTube and in Instagram. 
and she is uh, with our regular content covering her vintage vinyl uh, side of the business and then vintage as well, and is doing a series of uh, shows on Wednesdays and then vinyl on Fridays. So take, take a look at her, make sure you're following her. And if you're following me, uh, thanks for watching the video. If you could give it a thumbs up and uh, thanks so much for joining me. Thanks for putting your trust in Trusty Huckster. We're gonna sign things off and thanks again, Katie. Bye friends. Bye everybody.